Amen. Matthew chapter 27 tonight. Tonight we come to the Lord's table and it is a time of remembrance. It is a time for, it's really a, a memorial. It is um, it's a time to remember the Lord's blood and the Lord's body. And, and it points to the crucifixion of Jesus. It points to the sacrifice that Jesus made during his crucifixion. It, it points to the return also one day when he's coming back. And you know Jesus is coming back, right? And we're so excited about that. And maybe it will even happen before we can eat of this Lord's Supper. And anybody would be, would you guys be okay with that? If that happened, I think that'd be pretty cool. When we remember the Lord's body, we remember the cross. Um, Jesus said, this do as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. And so when we remember the Lord's body, we remember Calvary, we remember the cross. The day Jesus died was a unique day. There had never been a day like it before. There would never be a day like it afterwards. It was a day when man murdered his maker. The death Jesus died on the cross of Calvary was also unique. There had never been a death like it before, and there will be, never be a death like it in the future. Because when Jesus died that day on Calvary, the Bible says he was dying for the sin of the whole world. So with such a day and such a death, we ought not be surprised that the day Jesus died at Calvary, there were a bunch of miracles that took place. Did you, do you know that? Uh, it was a day that was full of miracles. There's, as God has dealt with man, there hasn't always been just unending miracles. They're supernatural. They are miracles because they don't happen all the time, right? That's, that's part of why they occur. You, it helps you understand who God is and why he is and why he came. And so much of the time, the miracles substantiate um, the, the message of the person doing them, the fact that God is with them. Even scientists believe that there's at least one miracle, that something came from nothing. Nothing blew up and made everything. So miracles are not some incredibly hard thing to believe in. But as you think about Jesus and you think about God and what happened over time, there are times that there were specific, there were, there were miracles. One was at the creation. At creation, there was, that, that was a supernatural event. At the Exodus, there were miracles. There were 10 plagues that all were kind of like God making fun of 10 false gods through, the, through those plagues and all the things that happened then. When Jesus was born, there was a bunch of miracles. And as Jesus did his earthly ministry, he, he conducted miracles. He did all kinds of things. Uh, as Jesus um, got to Calvary and died for our sins, there were, there were miracles even then. And tonight I want to point to three. Well, actually point to four or five, actually. But I'm going to mainly talk about three. We're going to look at three miracles, the supernatural events that occurred the day Jesus died that teach us why the cross of Calvary means so much to us. The first miracle that I want to point to is the miracle of darkness. Darkness is a miracle here which points to separation. Separation. Matthew 27, 45 says this. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness all over all the land unto the ninth hour. Evidently, Jesus was crucified at nine o'clock in the morning and at 12 noon, who agrees with me that at noon, it's the brightest part of the day, right? And at the brightest part of the day, according to the scripture, there was darkness that settled all over the land until three o'clock in the afternoon. An eclipse of the sun occurs when the moon gets between the earth and the sun. And coming up in about a week and a half on April 8th, um, there's going to be a total eclipse over the, of the sun over North America. In Hancock County, it, we're going to experience a total solar eclipse. This happens when the moon casts its shadow on the earth as it passes between earth and the sun. A total solar eclipse occurs when the moon appears to totally do that. The partial eclipse will 
uh, begin at 1.55 p.m. in our county, and it will reach its maximum peak of to- total darkness at 3.10 in the afternoon. The last solar eclipse visible in Ohio was in, anybody know? 1806. So it's been a while. The next one is, if the Lord tarries is coming, scheduled to happen. Well, he may, it may happen before this next one. But the one after that, 2099, which I probably won't be here for. Unless I turn 120-something, right? <laughs> on the day Jesus died on the cross, and I'm not saying I know it was an eclipse. I just know that there was darkness, supernatural Darkness, and that darkness lasted three hours. This is not an eclipse of the sun, but it was God supernaturally bringing darkness over the cross of Calvary. It was predicted. Did you know that was predicted in the Bible? Amos chapter 8, verse 9 says this, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. There was darkness over all the land. From north to south, it was dark. From east to west, it was dark. In the villages and in the cities over all the land, the Bible says that it was dark and it was God's doing. Blackness everywhere. One hymn writer put it this way. Well might the sun, well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in when Christ the maker, mighty maker died for man the creature's sin. When God created the world, he did it in light. He said, when he created the world, let there be light. And in a sense, at this moment, he says, let there be dark. Why? Well, what Jesus says in this moment kind of gives us a clue. In verse number 46, you guys have your Bible there? You see what it says? Jesus, what did Jesus say in that moment? My God... My God, why hast thou forsaken me? The word that Jesus spoke out of the supernatural darkness that day gives us some insight into the separation which occurred and the meaning of the cross on that day. Jesus says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? amazing thing. There's a, there's a question there. Why? Jesus asked why. You ever ask why? Why did this happen? Why does that happen? When Jesus died on the cross, all of life's mysteries gathered there and in that word, why? At the cross of Calvary, God indicated to us that one day, He will explain it all, and one day he will make it clear. Why have you forsaken me? This word forsaken, the Lord Jesus uh, tells us why there was darkness that day and what he was doing that day that he died on the cross. God's love for you and me is revealed at Calvary. God loves you with a love that would break your heart if you comprehended it. God loves you and me with a love that's not ending But God who loves the sinner also hates the sin. The Bible says that God is a holy God and he can't let sin go. And so this darkness was a sense of foreboding and judgment. It speaks to the fact that there was a separation between him and his father, between God the Father and God the Son. It's supernatural in how it happened. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Not merely carrying our sins to the cross, Jesus was made sin for us on the cross. And in that moment, that dark moment, when the blessed, pure Son of God was made all of the sins of the world, The wrath of God was poured out on the Lord Jesus Christ. God's wrath burned itself out in the person of the Lord Jesus on that day on the cross. And that's why Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did he? In that moment, it's because 
God saw his son become sin. God the Father turned away from his son because he could not look upon sin. There on that cross, the Lord Jesus paid the price for our sins. If you study the life of Jesus, he had a keen awareness of the presence of God, right? Jesus was always talking about his father. On so many occasions, he lifted his eyes to heaven and Talk to the Father. There was times where, when he taught us to pray, how did he teach us to pray? Our Father who art in heaven. There was a model prayer there. Um, Jesus taught that. Then when the Lord Jesus was facing that cross, he made a statement to his disciples in John 16, 32. Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was conscious of the presence of the Father. In fact, he prayed to the Father, not my will, but thine, Father, be done. But when the Lord Jesus Christ was on that cross and when there was darkness over the face of the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ knew that it was what it was to be forsaken of God, to be abandoned by the Heavenly Father. Loneliness is a terrible thing. There are a lot of people who are lonely. There are elderly people that are very lonely. There are singles who are lonely. You you can live in a city with as many people in a county with as many people as Finley, Ohio, and you can still have loneliness in your heart. But what a wonderful thing to know that when Jesus was forsaken of the heavenly father, when Jesus knew what it meant to be abandoned by the heavenly father, he was doing that so you and I might never be abandoned by God. When we know Christ as Savior, In Hebrews 13, for those of us who knew Christ as Savior, the Lord promises us, I will never leave thee nor forsake me. That day at Calvary, Jesus descended into the depths of hell and knew what it was to be abandoned by God. That's the awful thing about hell, to be abandoned by God forever, to never hear God again, to never know the presence of God, to never have the Spirit of God touch your heart again. If you're here in tonight's service and you never received the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says if you will invite Jesus into your life, he'll come into your life in the person of the Holy Spirit. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Since Jesus came into my life, I have never been alone. The Heavenly Father has always been with me and he'll be with you as well. So that first miracle that we see tonight is this miracle of darkness and it points to separation. There's a second miracle I want to tell you about. It shows up in verse 50, and it's the miracle of the torn veil. The torn veil as is a miracle of completion. Verse 50 says this, Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. From how? How did it happen? From the top to the bottom. We put together some of the the timeline of what happened as we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that all give us this narration of what happened at the cross. And evidently in in verse 50, this is my speculation, Jesus cried with that, again with a loud voice. That's essentially maybe when he said, it is finished, tetelestai, it is finished. And when that happened, it wasn't a cry of defeat. It was a cry of victory. It was a cry of, not of frustration. Jesus was not mourning that he was dying in the sense that he, this brevity of life, he wasn't frustrated that he died too soon. He he was saying the work of redemption is done. No more to be done. And you see here what happened he did, God does another miracle. It's God reached down from heaven to the temple and took that veil in the temple and tore it in two. Now, what was the veil? The veil was the thing that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. On the inside of the Holy of Holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant, and on top of it was a slab of pure gold, and cherubims were on each side of the slab looking inward. Only one time a year could one man go into that holy of holies and they, they would take 
blood of a spotless lamb and they would sprinkle it on that mercy seat. The curtain, this, this curtain or veil was the obstruction that kept people out of the Holy of Holies. I'm told, I read this week, it was, it's 60 feet high and 30 feet wide and was the thickness of a man's hand. So this was not just some small, thin sheet. This was a large, thick veil. I'm sure it was beautiful. It was made of threads of blue and purple and red. And basically what the veil was saying as it was there was, stay out. Stay out. Most people who've ever lived never went into that room. A priest once a year. You think about some of the holy men that have gone before. Guys like Moses, guys like Isaiah, Jeremiah. They, and there, Moses wasn't a priest. Isaiah, Jeremiah, they probably had never, they'd never been into that veil. Inside was where for centuries the blood of that lamb was placed on the mercy seat and only the high priest could go in there. But there came a day when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary and God, this is why I say it's a miracle, he supernaturally took that veil and tore it. How did he tear it? Tear it? From top to bottom. Could you imagine like the priests that were there when that happened? Could you imagine them, all, what's going on? And how incredible it would have been to see that happen. No one touching it. It just touches, just going from top to bottom. At approximately three o'clock in the afternoon, the time of the evening prayer, priests all over making those sacrifices when all of, all of a sudden the veil from top to bottom just ripped in two and they could see directly into the Holy of Holies. And that miracle tells you and me what God did on the cross, what Jesus did on the cross. The work of redemption was done. It's telling us that when Jesus died on the cross, the old was completed and the new was inaugurated. All of the sacrifices, all of the offerings, all of the pictures, everything had pointed to the sacrifice that, that was fulfilled the moment, that moment in the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, it had all been repeat, all been completed. Hebrews 10.10 10 says this, By the which we are all sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Isn't that beautiful? Because the Lord Jesus' body had already been shed, his blood had already been shed, there was no more holy of holies, no more veils that had to hold people out. That's why Hebrews 10, 19, that we said before, says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into that holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. When the Lord God reached down from heaven and tore the literal veil in two, it was a picture of what Jesus was doing on that cross. For when Christ died on the cross, his flesh was torn and God was saying, I've opened up the way into my presence through the death of my own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That veil, the veil that was there said, stay out. But the torn veil, Jesus Christ's body says, come in. I am the way, the truth and the life, no man comes to the Father but by me. Isn't that cool? There was a miracle of darkness. There was this miracle of the torn veil. There were other miracles. Um, in Matthew 27, there's two other miracles we don't have time to talk about. It says that the earth shook and the rocks cracked apart and the graves were opened. When the Lord Jesus Christ died, it took the... It shook creation. There was this earthquake that was a miracle. In verse 52 and 53, it says that the graves were opened and many body of the saints which slept arose and came out of graves after his resurrection and went into the city, holy city, and appeared unto many. <laughs> what an incredible thing. When Jesus rose, when Jesus uh, arose, they arose. The miracle is a picture of what Jesus' death had done for you and me. 
the death of Jesus Christ had made possible the forgiveness of sins, but it had also ensured that just like Jesus rose from the dead, we're going to be raised from the dead one of these days too. Isn't that amazing? Because of what Jesus did on the cross, one of these days the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout. The dead in Christ will be raised first, and we're going to be coming up out of the graves ourselves. There was the miracle of darkness. There was the miracle of the torn veil. There was the earthquake and these graves, these people that came up out of the graves. But the last one I want to show you is the miracle of salvation. The miracle of salvation. Look at verse 54. It says, now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they fear greatly saying, truly, this was the son of God. A centurion was a military officer who had a hundred men under his command. I wonder how it was that morning when he was assigned whatever duty he had. Hey, you're going to go crucify these men. Can you imagine him not knowing what was in store? He goes to crucify these guys. Those guys knew something about death, didn't they? The Romans. And so he goes and I'm kind of reading between the lines. And when he, when he sees who's being killed, maybe he'd heard of Jesus before, maybe he hadn't, but there's a sign over the, over the, the, on the top of the cross, you know, the king of the Jews. And I'm sure he heard the rhetoric, you know, he probably knew that this one over here, this thief is being crucified because of what he did. And that made sense. He'd killed those kind of people before. This one. I mean, that's for sure. What's, why, why are they killing this one? Well, this, I'm sure he heard, this one says, claims to be the son of God, right? And probably at the beginning, he probably scoffed, right? Hey, look, they're, they're mocking. In fact, we know that when he got scourged, what did they do? What did, what did the Roman soldiers do with Jesus? They mocked him. They put a, a uh, robe on him. They took a crown of thorns. You think that they're making fun of him and they're pressing it on his head. But then he experiences these miracles. He hears Jesus say things like, Father, forgive them for they know what not what they do. He sees the miracle of the darkness. He sees the, he experiences the earthquake. And after he'd seen all of that and watched Jesus do what he did, he says this incredible moment, right? After seeing those things that were done, what was done? Was it just what the, just what the guy had done? Just what the crowd had done? No. Was it just what Jesus had said? I'm sure that was part of it. But it also was what God had done. And those miracles there. And he came to the conclusion. What, would it, what was his conclusion? Truly, this was the Son of God. I don't know what the story is on this guy. I don't know if in this moment he was repenting of his sins. I know he was acknowledging that Jesus in that moment had made a claim and he, at least in this moment, believed it. They not only witnessed miracles at the cross, they experienced this miracle. The miracle that they, that they had seen. What am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is, and this is what's so amazing about the cross. Jesus, while he was on the cross, was not only paying for the sins of the whole world. He was paying for the sins of the people who were mocking him. He was paying for the sins of the people that literally were killing him. 
when he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. When he says, why hast thou forsaken me? He was forsaken. He was offering his body and his blood for the very ones who mocked and, and, and crucified and killed them. And what I would say very clearly about this centurion, about all those that were mocking him is this, that Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, died for their sins too. And if they were to place their faith and trust in Jesus, they would go to heaven. Isn't that an amazing thing? I don't like it when people cut me off in traffic. I sometimes have a hard time wanting to forgive people like that. And Jesus dying on the cross was dying for their sin too. And that's the true miracle. That's the point of the cross, the miracle of salvation. The miracle that salvation is offered to us by the vicarious death of Jesus on the cross and that it can be received by those of us who are responsible for his death. It was a miracle when the darkness came. It teaches us that, that our sin separates us from a holy God. It was a miracle when the veil was torn. It tells us that Jesus paid the ultimate price for our sins when he died on the cross. It was a miracle when the earth shook and the graves opened up and all these miracles got the attention of everybody that day. But the greatest miracle of all is when a soul turns from their sins and by faith invites Jesus into their hearts and lives. It's the miracle that Jesus is still performing. Lives are being changed. People are still coming to the cross. They're still meeting this Jesus who's the son of God who died on the cross for our sins. And we don't have to go to hell. Anybody glad for that tonight? We don't have to go to hell. And not only do we not have to go to hell, we could go to heaven. And God saves us from our sin and then he puts us on his mission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. What is it? Living he loved me. Dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. Wait, rising, not, I just ruined the end of the message. One day he's coming. Oh, glorious day. <laughs> he's coming back. Let's work while it's day. The night's coming that no man can work. There was a moment before all this happened where Jesus was with his disciples. It was just a little while before all this happened. Paul writes about it in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, where he says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks... He broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread, and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Whosoever there, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that drinketh, eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not condemn with, be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order 
when I come. This is really good instruction for us because it tells us the purpose of this ordinance of the local church that Jesus gave to his disciples who then practiced as local New Testament churches. They had this memorial meal where they would remember the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. They remembered the miracles at the cross and what happened and why God's blood had to be shed and why the Son of God's body was torn. And so tonight, here in just a minute, we're going to do that. I think it's interesting how experiential it is in the sense that we literally take that broken and it's not the actual body of Jesus. It's symbolic, but we take it and we consume it. We chew it. We swallow it. We drink this juice and we taste it and it causes us to remember. This is not something to be done because we're hungry. It's not something to be done and to be taken lightly. This is a local church coming together and remembering the Lord's death. And I think it's pretty neat when it says the the Lord's death till he come. So tonight, uh, if you are a believer and uh, you are part of our local church, then we desire for you to come and take this uh, this Lord's Supper with us. Um, there's kind of three positions to the Lord's Supper. There's open, where we just believe that just anybody who wants to can take it. Um, we believe that this is not something for unbelievers. This is for believers. We believe it's an ordinance of the local church. So there's a closed position that says that you have to be a member of our church um, to take it at all. There's a close position that says that if you are a baptized believer, you can take this position. Um, we won't forbid you from taking it. And so we, we come to that close position where uh, we leave it to your conscience to take that. Here's the, here's the main idea, though. The Bible says that we ought to take it worthily. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup of the body unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man so examine himself and let him eat of that bread and the drink of that cup. So we're going to do that just for a minute. We're going to have a moment where Miss Jan's going to come and she's going to play. And uh, I'd like for you to bow your heads and close your eyes.